Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show on which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. What a gift each and every one of you are. Ian and I so appreciate being able to bring this show to you every week. We have so many wonderful things we're planning to roll out over the next coming months. we got a really exciting announcement next week. Be sure and stay tuned in for that. Don't forget Ian's brand new book, The Story of You, is now available everywhere. Fine books are sold. Hey, we have a fantastic guest today. He is a touring painter, performance artist, storyteller, and more. We're talking about and to Scott Erickson today. He's got a brand new book called Say Yes. I love the word yes. And Scott's message just so resonates with me. For those of you that follow me on Instagram, it was actually Scott's artwork that I was using throughout all of Holy Week. So he's got a lot of really inspiring stuff. You're going to enjoy this conversation. Again, Really, really exciting stuff we're about to roll out. Be sure and tune in next week because Ian will be making a very special announcement and it's regarding something that many of you have asked for for some time now. Hey again, we're glad that you're with us. So glad to have Scott on the show. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now let's get to the host of our show, Ian Cron. Scott Erickson, author of the book, Say Yes, Discovering the Surprising Life Beyond the Death of a Dream. Welcome to Typology. Thank you, thank you. You eloquently said that subtitle so well. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Well, I, as an author- From one I, author to another. That's right, I, I, uh, I know the importance of getting the whole title down. Yes, that's right. I do. Well, uh, you are an Enneagram 4. Yeah. I am an Enneagram 4. Anthony is an Enneagram 4. So this will either be a boring, monochromatic conversation <laughs> wow. or it, it will get intense and beautiful. Hopefully yeah. the latter. Hopefully, Hopefully the latter. full of authenticity. That's what we got. That's well, right. right. That's what we, that's got. we got to offer. <clears throat> you know, mention, you mentioned authenticity and uh, your book, Say Yes, uh, is really a very authentic exploration of what happens when a dream dies and what our response can be to it, mm. and, and or what our potential response can be to it. And I'm, I'm thinking that there's probably no one more equipped to tell folks about that journey than an Enneagram 4. Mm. <laughs> that's, my, like, that's my sense. So, so tell me about who you are, Enneagram 4. Yeah, that's a, that's a great insight, because I think it's a, it has to be an honest journey. Um, I think I just, the, I'll often speak at places and people will be like, that was just so honest. And I'm always like, is that not what we're doing here? <laughs> like, I thought that was the point was being honest. Um, uh, so you want to, you want to kind of know, you want me to give a brief summation of kind of what my life looks like, like what I do and things like that as no, according I wanna, to I my wanna, fourness. Yeah. I want to know about you and your journey as an Enneagram four. How did you discover you were a four as you reflect on your life? Uh, uh, how has being a four been a, a great benefit and a great challenge to you? Yeah, I think when I first came across the Enneagram and started learning about it, I had and I had the experience when I read four, I was like, oh, I hate that person. You know, it's like the person you're like, that can't be me, <laughs> but it is. Uh, so I, I had that like cliche experience where I was like, oh, that that one, it's the one you are. Um, but it, it really helped me the framework of it Ian, is this true? Maybe this is just a legend I heard about you, but do you, I've heard a quote, is this your quote, which is, um, none of this is true, it's just really, really helpful. Is that, <laughs> did I hear that from you? Is that something you've said in a way about yeah, the Enneagram? A, yeah, it's in the road back to you. I say, okay, yeah. I, I quote George Box, who says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Ah, uh, that's it. That's it. There you go. Well, it's telephoned all the way to, to me. And I, and I think that's how my experience has been, which is like, it just gave me some tools to go, you're a certain kind of personality type, you deal and you look at the world a certain way. And there are really helpful offerings that you have, like, and, and I have actually really embraced that, that like my gift that I can contribute to a space or a conversation is the gift of authenticity or being honest. Um, and now learning how to do that in, in not like an emotional dump on everybody is 
uh, you know, part of building a skill, but going, how, how do you do that in a storyteller? And then as a visual artist, and then how can I uh, bring that kind of authenticity to the artwork I'm making and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so the Enneagram really helped me in understanding like my work and how I could be a communicator to the world. I have a, when I sensed that I was being called to be an artist, which was around my late 20s, 27, I was a high school teacher at the time. And um, I, I had a, a moment in my classroom, like during a prep period, I was writing on the whiteboard and I stopped and I was like, there's something else I'm being invited to. I, I'm not quite sure what it is, but there's something else. And I was about to go to New York City to visit some friends there. I met a bunch of artists and I was flying back and I, I just on the plane, I, I knew I was like, I, I think I, I'll always regret it if I don't try to be an artist. And mm. I had this moment where uh, that felt a little disappointing in some ways. Like I knew I wanted to do it, but I was like, oh, really? That's what I have to offer? And this might be a little dated for some, so I'll try to do a little uh, history lesson. But there is this great environmental propaganda cartoon in the 90s called Captain Planet. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you ever saw this. It was a cartoon for kids. Uh, the story goes, the Earth spirit Gaia who was played by Whoopi Goldberg, uh, gave out these five rings to teenagers across the world to fight polluters. This is the whole storyline. And these five rings, so four of them were like really powerful things like earth and wind and fire and water, also a great band. Uh, but like they, uh, they would use these powers to like fight people who were running copy machines all the time or you know oil coming out of the ground but there's this one kid he had the fifth ring and it was the heart ring and uh his ring his power was to instill caring and empathy into the people of the world to care for the planet and when i when i was like uh i think i'm called to be an artist i felt like what i was getting was the heart ring like and you can imagine this scenario there's all these really powerful forces in the world duking it out right and and then there's this one kid standing there holding his ring and he's like i just want you to feel okay i want you to feel <laughs> <laughs> and, and i was like that kid's gonna get his butt kicked that's that that that's who that kid is but i i i in that moment was like i accept i accept the heart ring i accept what i i i understand what i have and as i've learned to be an artist you know, g guns and money are going to change a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of powers in the world. But if you really want to transform people, you have to know how to transform hearts. And you have to learn the language of the heart. And I actually think that I do have the heart ring. And I think my, like, Enneagram 4 in that, in the heart uh, triangle or whatever, the heart zone, it's, it's become like, oh, what? in order to wield this heart ring with my work, I need to know the conversation of the heart. I need to know the conversation of our soul. I need to know all these things. And so that has become a big part of, you know, not only being a producer, but then like, what am I taking in? What am I listening to? How am I learning? And then filtering that out through my work. Hmm. Beautiful. I, uh, you know, for uh, a fairly lengthy season, I, I did a, a pretty deep dive. I was in graduate school at, at Fordham in the, the Jesuit University of New York, and mm -hmm. at the time I was studying a lot about uh, the theology of the art, mm -hmm. and uh, really about uh, the power of art to bypass the human intellect and win the soul through imagination. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the gifts that fours <laughs> bring to the world is this capacity to help people to feel and to help people to see. I think about Joseph Conrad, mm -hmm. the great author, yeah. uh, Heart of Darkness, uh, among other things. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he has this great quote where he says, my job is to make you see, to yeah. really see. Yeah. And I, I would you know, sort of amend that and say, to see and feel. You know, mm. to see and mm -hmm. feel. And I do think that fours are, are so equipped to do that and equipped to help people go on journeys that they would be very hesitant to go on unless someone accompanied them. Which is a big part of what you do live, right? I mean, that's, a, that's such a huge part of what you do. You facilitate people taking a journey when you do your live thing. Yeah, yeah. So I do these kind of like live storytelling performance things. <laughs> I don't know. They're fun. We're and, fours, but, we understand. 
yeah. <laughs> but they, um, uh, the way that I view it is like, how do you slowly untie the knot? You know, mm. like if you get a, a rope that's tangled up, you can't just like yank it, yank it, yank it, because that makes it tighter. You have to gently like find out where the kinks are and slowly untie it. And I think about like a a journey of a time together as that is like, what is this kind of the steps to slowly untie this knot? And and really at the at the end, I want to I want to. Off, you know, I, I say often, I'm like, I'll be your story porter. Like I'll carry the heavy bags of tonight's performance, like making sure it's interesting and not boring. But like at some point, you're just gonna have to finish climbing the mountain. You're gonna have to finish the journey. You're, hopefully your story comes up in the midst of my story. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, I love what you were saying about art. I, I have come to find that one of the functions of visual art and all art, I guess, poetry and, and uh, music and other things is that um, art is a bit of an excavation tool. Um, so a great question is to ask, what does this mean? That's a fine question. A better question is, uh, what is this pulling out of you? Like, what is this excavating out of you? Um, I did a couple books with my friend Justin McRoberts about prayer. And what, what we dialed in on is we were like, prayer is this ever present ongoing conversation that you're having with existence and the giver of existence. And we created a book of words and images. And we were like, these are not prayers. These are excavation tools because what they're doing is they're like helping you get to the thing that's already in there. This isn't a book of contents. The content is already inside. How do you get in touch with the content inside? For example, I say this a lot is like, have you ever been in your car and a song comes on and you turn up your radio and you're like, oh, this is my song. Like, what are you saying? You're saying somehow the artist lyrically and sonically perfectly described what it feels like to be in your own skin. And then that song becomes a vehicle for honesty or a vehicle to approach God with, to be like, this is how I feel about my life. This is what I actually think. This, this artist gave me the words, the images, the lyrics, the, the harmonics to portray that. And so uh, I think that I've started to understand in like my work and, I'm, and, and I would say like what I'm trying to do is giving a visual vocabulary for the spiritual journey. And it's, be, it's because it's trying to be an excavation tool for you. Like when you see it, it's ex, it's excavating this deep conversation you're having. Like for example, I'll have people tell me that they're like, I'll have your piece of art up for a whole year and I looked at it every day and it just like became an anchor of hope or a place I could come back to. And it was like, and that's great. Is it the image itself or is it what the image is excavating out of you that you need to talk about? Your hopes, your fears, your wishes, your your um you know the the things you don't know how to move forward in and it keeps that conversation to the forefront so uh, i mean i'm not saying like all art has that function you know all artists aren't trying to do that with their art um i just think that's for me as a person who's cons- who really thinks about spiritual formation through image contemplation that's the kind of art i'm and experiences <clears throat> that i'm trying to do is like how can i be a good guide to to give you excavation tools that can bring out your own interior conversation mm. so the the book uh say yes mm-hmm. uh concerns itself with how do we respond when along life's way we experience the death of a dream like yeah. what comes next you know and oftentimes yeah. i think that the title is really winsome and accurate right we we can either respond with a yes with a belief that somehow or another in the death of the dream, there is a divine invitation to something else. Yeah. Uh, or we can lapse into resignation and despair, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. This, these are the cards, this is what I'm dealt, and uh, I will just uh, limp forward the best I can with plan B, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let, tell me about how you came to write the book and then what wisdom if you can in some brief way yeah that you have to offer to a reader yeah <laughs> that's a good, what is there any wisdom in this book scott that's great <laughs> i love it i well i had this experience uh not too uncommon but i was about to uh, i was approaching 40 um which i know is a number created by astronomy but it feels like a threshold it is some kind of like 
what is the second half of my life? Um, and I don't think this conversation necessitates that threshold, but it just, it brought it about. But I had this experience where I put my kids to bed one night and I walked out of the room and I noticed I was crying and it wasn't because of anything we had had like a magical bedtime story. I just, something was happening to me and um, I couldn't stop crying. And I eventually made my way to our only bathroom and I just sat on the toilet and I wept for like an hour. And um, my wife found me, she's like, are you okay? And I was like, I don't know what's happening to me. And she's like, do you want to talk about it? And I was like, my tears are me talking about it. Like I just, something is happening to me. And uh, with some time and reflection, I realized what was happening to me is like a dream was dying, that there had been this dream in me, this idea of how I thought my life would turn out or what I hoped to do in my life, um, where I hoped I would have been. And it, I realized it wasn't going to come true. And like physiologically and psychologically, I was like grieving the loss and death of that dream. And, but I still had this deeper desire underneath that. Um, and I was like, I guess I, I kind of am cueing it, cluing in on like who I want to be in the world and what I'd like to do. And I guess I got to start now. And immediately I was confronted by these like deep interior arguments that I call the voice of giving up. And so I had to develop these like arguments and practices to kind of counteract those. The interesting thing that happened though is, and, and this is, you know, my publisher's like, don't tell the whole book. And I won't tell the whole book in this, but like the, the main crux of the book is this, is that a dream. So, you know, we, we can get a little like semantics, gymnastics a little bit here, but like a dream is a cherished desire. That's the definition. I would say a dream is the imagined version of your life where you don't have any weaknesses or limitations. When we imagine a dream scenario, we don't ever think about the weaknesses or limitations that we would have in that moment. When we imagine like finishing a marathon, we don't, we don't imagine like the nine months of painful physical therapy it might take to get our knees to work, <laughs> to run a marathon, because now we're in our forties and they don't work anymore. Or when we start a business, we don't imagine like the complicated relationship we might have with an investor who fronted the capital to help us start that business. A dream has to die because a dream is a version of yourself that doesn't have any vulnerabilities. Now, vulnerabilities aren't necessarily your weaknesses or limitations. It's your relationship to those. Do you, are you ashamed that you have them? Are you afraid of them? Do you hide them away? And I would say the spiritual journey is to realize your vulnerabilities become the way in which you connect to each other, the world, to the divine. And so the surprise the surprise on the other side of the death of the dream is, you know, like embracing your vulnerabilities and finding that they add the unique way that you get to be a contribution to the world. Hmm. Um, I give a little parable in, in the book about this like ship that uh, is going on this, has this great purpose it's to go on this journey. And it has these like seeds inside of it to take them to another place. And then on the way, this unforeseen storm wrecks the ship and it's broken and wrecked and, and uh, it's turned upside down and these seeds germinate and they grow and the ship becomes like an island with a forest on it. And these other ships along the journey, like other ships have been wrecked by the storm, the unforeseen storm, and they come and they rest. And then the ship gives up its wood. It builds like houses for the crew. It eventually builds like a lighthouse and it helps like other ships along the unforeseen sea, like who have been wrecked by the, the unforeseen storm gives them comfort and, and helps them out. And then, the, and then the ship realizes like, oh, the way that in, in which I was able to give the most help to the world was through my own shipwreck. And, and it wonders if that was the purpose all along. It's like a little parable about like, often the places, like what the, the surprise of our life is that the place that we're most wounded, shipwrecked, we're most vulnerable is the way in which we provide light or give light or help others in the world. Mm. And I would say, you know, I tie in like Ignatian, uh, the, the path of desire. Cause I, my submission is that like, we all have this, the secret path of desire that's been put in us to walk and that's a divine path. But what needs to get out of the way is the, the, the version of the, perf the perfect version of yourself or your life that is going to accomplish that. And, and really it's like the slow daily work of being a vulnerable contribution is, is what leads you into a surprising 
life on the other side of the death of that dream. So, yeah. the, and the, so the book is really like uh, having that bigger conversation and then giving these like three specific practices that I still do to this day that help me embrace my vulnerabilities, but help me move forward in what I'm doing because we live in a massive culture of comparison. We have these inner narratives that we're always dealing with. And uh, I think the last one is like a having a bit of, <laughs> this is so Enneagram 4, having a bit of a healthy death practice because we only have so much time, our lives are finite. And I actually found that the wisdom at the end of life is something that you can apply now to hopefully the very long lives we still had ahead of us. Hmm. And those are, that's kind of what the book is about. I also, there's a hundred illustrations in the book because, uh, you know, I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said before. Isn't that making a book nowadays? It's all been said before, but I ran it through the filter of myself. But what I also noticed is that there's no image vocabulary for these things. And I think, I think words are really important. I do, but for me, like images help me remember things better. In fact, I just read like um, Dr. Kurt Thompson's soul of desire, his latest book. Mm -hmm. And it's great. Um, and but in order for me to retain the information, I'm going through the places I underlined and I'm making illustrations out of the concepts he's saying. <laughs> because for me to understand what he's saying, I have to see it. And by, so I will image it to help me see it and understand. So even in the very, like at the very end of the book, I have my practices laid out, but I give an image for each one because I'm like, sure, maybe you can memorize the mantra, but also if you just remember that like image, that'll help you understand like how to move forward. So that's, yeah. that's, that's my unique contribution is like giving images along the way of this conversation. Yeah, great. So Anthony, mm -hmm. do you want to go there? Let's do it. One, <laughs> is there like a secret? Is like a secret? <laughs> like a, no, secret it's discussion? actually, I'm, I'm about to ask him a, a, a personal question and you can, oh, perhaps, okay. you can perhaps ask me the same one, but yeah. talk to me in brief about the death of a dream in your life. Mm. Uh, I would say the one that springs to mind is I had a label in California, lot, huge backing, all the money, all the marketing, and in a heartbeat, it all went sideways. Mm. And I was, you know, part of my identity was wrapped up in what I was doing and what I was going to do mm. um, with that group of people. And yeah, that was a, that was a death. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I would say for me, yeah. Uh, that I had something happen this past year and actually it's honestly, it's too personal for me to talk about publicly yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. like still, yeah. it's just too personal. Yeah. Um, but it was the death of a dream about who I was. Mm. It mm -hmm. was the death of a persona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was the death of my having convinced myself of mm. my role in the world, my invulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the death of uh, a, a lot of pride mm -hmm. uh, in uh, who the person I had cultivated. Uh, and that in many ways, I'm going very vulnerable here. Mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, the person I had pretended to be for so long that I even I was convinced I was that person. Wow. Mm. Um, and, mm. and in a way, it was the death of my brand. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, yeah. So maybe one day in the near future when I am given a green light, a divine green light, I will share the details, you yeah. know, because like you, Scott, as a four, it, it is actually really important for me to be true uh, yeah. and to also yeah. be somebody that, and as a, this is very four-ish, I think. I'm always, and I've done this since I was a little kid, I've been f fascinated with, with what suffering means mm -hmm. and like how people respond to suffering mm -hmm. right mm. so i think at some point because i think that's part of my vocation i will share it but at the moment it's too tender and mm -hmm. too real mm -hmm. to do yeah. it all right so scott we've just shared i haven't shared the details but you get the idea that it's fairly, yeah. signi you're fairly yeah. significant yeah and you know what you're saying is i i don't think the death of a dream is a dream 
often means like some object or thing or place we'd like to go. But I actually say, I think, I think that the dream is that you would be the kind of person mm-hmm. that has that thing that is in that situation that is going on that trip. It's more about being a kind of person. So when you're saying that, I'm like, that's, mm-hmm. yeah, that's it. Cause my, <laughs> it, mine wasn't even like super, really like tragic as much as like, I think I started realizing I wanted to, I was like, I think I'm actually much more of a performing artist than just like a studio audience, uh, artist. Meaning I was like, I think I need to start doing like performing arts. And I felt like I was so far from that moment, mm-hmm. like in my life. Cause I was like, all of a sudden I have young kids and, and I was like, man, I wish I knew this at 18. Cause I kind of just feel like I've been like falling down some stairs into my present day, my whole life. And I, some of my heroes like knew at 18, what they wanted to do. And they've been building careers. And I, and there was this moment of like, I guess I got to start now at 40. And the main argument was like, nobody gives a shit about a 40 year old man trying to start becoming a performing artist. And I was like, that's a really strong argument because it sounds embarrassing. (laughs) It sounds embarrassing to start something new at 40. Um, But then I found that there's this whole other, for one, I found out that many people have started new things at certain times in their life, second halves of their life. And then also the dream of like, oh, I should have had it when I was younger. I needed to let that die to get to what was asking me right now. And then what are my particular vulnerabilities as now I'm 44, as a 44 year old man learning how to become a performing artist? What does that allow me to do? What are my off, you know, anyways, that's just kind of stuff. But I, when you said what you said, I was like, hell yeah, man. It's about, and that, what you, what you alluded to and you don't need to go into, but I think as, especially as a four and a creator, mm-hmm. that persona who we hope to be, mm-hmm. I don't know, it, that, that brings out some of my own fears and things and uh, stuff too. So I remember in my situation that you asked me about, I, th- what was so hard was a big part of me was like, this is why I'm here. Mm. You know, this is why I'm here on this planet to do what I was doing. And it, and it was, I'd said no to a lot of opportunities yeah, and this was sort of the dream being realized, and when that went away, it was you know crushing to my soul and to my reason for living in a lot of ways. Yeah, uh, did you ever did you ever find words for what you know you were weeping about in the bathroom? I just wonder, did you ever were you able to wrap your words around what that was, what was dying there? Yeah, it was. I started to realize the kind of person I wanted to be in the world. And I felt like I was so late to getting to that. Gotcha. Like, um, like I was like, Oh God, I was, it's the, it's the, is it the faces? Ooh la la. Like, I wish that Mm -hmm. I knew what to know now, not even just like a knowledge thing, but of like, Oh damn it. Why didn't I choose this? Why didn't I know this at 18? Cause I would have directed my life much differently in order to pursue this thing that Mm. I know I want to do. And, you know, once you have like, I have three kids now, you know, there are real particularities about what I'm doing. Like, I can't even, I'm interested in comedy, not trying to be a standup, but like, it's something I practice a bit, but I can't do a 12.30 AM set on a Wednesday. Cause I got to get up in the morning and make lunches and take kids to school. And <laughs> I can't go on like cross country tours and do venue after venue because I don't want my kids to hate me. And I only have like a small amount of time with them before they get older and they move on. And so these are like my, these are my vulnerabilities that I have to go. Well, what does it look like to move forward now? Mm-hmm. How do I say yes? Mm, here we go. Tagline. How do I say yes to the life I find myself in and the way forward that's asking me to wait forward. So, but yeah, the, the, I think the, man, this is a good question. I, the tears were not just like knowing who I want to be, but just also going like, I've never, I haven't had assurance for most of my life and now I'm kind of getting in touch with it. Mm. And I think like the, 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 <laughs> The just, you know, when you're in your 20s and you're just after school and you're like, what do I do now? I just like go into the world and and try stuff. You know, it's so like the the myriad of options of being an adult is overwhelmingly frightening. And just in kind of like, I guess I just start. What if I get it wrong? What if I don't make the right choice? What if I get locked in on something? And 
And then years later, I want to change. Can you do that? Like, I think these are the, mm. it's, it was like all of those things were like coming to the surface, all these deep, fearful unknowns that I had to deal, that I went through and, and was like, oh no, I wish I would have known back then. And then, and, and I had to just like, I was grieving that. Mm. It's, it's actually real. I don't know if I've ever really talked about it. It's, I, I think that's, this is a really helpful question. It was like, because I just was at a college last week and, you know, and speaking to university students for a few days and their questions are just like, I mean, they're very capable and, you know, they got a lot of energy and stuff, but there is that like, when I leave the structure of school, which I've had my whole life, what do you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's a question to all of us. It's just like, what do we make of our lives? What do you want from a life? Mm. Um, yeah. And I would say that there is internal directions or internal, there's, a, there's interior um, whispers, guidelines that you can get in touch with that are helping you point in that direction. Mm -hmm. Not all the answers are there, but there's some that'll be like, if you get quiet enough, you can start seeing some of the places you need to start walking towards. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I think, don't you think that <clears throat> given the nature of life, mm -hmm. that there is, it's inevitable <clears throat> that you will hit a moment when you realize that not just one, but probably several dreams have died. For sure. And that they are unrecoverable. For mm -hmm. sure. They are irreversible. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. the older you get, think of your life as a hallway with many doors, options. You know, I go through this door, I get to be a visual yeah. artist. I go through this door, I get to be a performance artist. I go through this door, I get to be an author, right? You just have all these doors when you leave college. Just, well, yeah. the hallway is yeah. loaded with doors. The older you get, the fewer the doors there are mm -hmm. yeah. in the hallway, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know? And you're like, oh, golly, you know, the idea of becoming a professional basketball player at 45, that's pretty much done. <laughs> that door is gone, you know, or this door is gone, you know, for whatever reason, or I have children. Now this door is gone. And, and you know, there, there is this kind of this requirement of becoming very creative uh, in that hallway the, the, as the doors decrease, mm -hmm. the number of doors decrease. Yeah. And where you, the questions have to become very, very focused, you know, like, okay, mm. these are the givens, right? These yeah. are the givens of my life. Now, yeah. how do I live uh, authentically, and perhaps contribute to the world in a way that uh, will be equivalent or even more than had I walked through the ideal door? that I think about at night at 2 a.m. Like, why didn't I become an actor? Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, well, that's a given. So now what next? Yeah. You know? And, and I think those outcomes, like, so even that one, like, oh, why didn't I become an actor? It's like, okay, well, what do you think being an actor would make you feel? I think it's really a lot of like, the art was like, well, I would feel this way about myself. I would be the kind of person who's this. Um, John, the guy who played Napoleon Dynamite, John Heater, is that his name? John Heder, Heater? You know, he acted, he did Napoleon Dynamite, then he acted in a bunch of films. He doesn't act anymore because he did it. And he's like, well, that's not the life I wanted. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, like the things we think we want, if we get there, we're like, well, it's really complicated to be an actor. And there's like, you know, you're on a set for four months and it, you kind of, you know, I don't know. That's maybe not the rhythm of life you want. I think the deeper question in that is like, what are, were you hoping from that? And then what in that is like, do you feel like that's bringing you to life or is it more about, well, then it'd give me purpose, meaning do you like acting? And then the question is like, well, what would it look like to start entering into that now? Is that, and I think these, mm -hmm. these practices like the death practice, um, which helps bring to surface like your deepest desires uh, that I submit is it's really getting in touch with like there's and this is kind of like with along like with you know Parker Palmer submits this and let your life speak or something that there's these kind of there's these innate things that are in you that you are like like that that want to come out that you want to pursue like you have a hierarchy of things you're interested in often we can choose the easier ones the lower ones because they're easier like, for example, I have like a mini death practice. And when I say death practice, I just like if I get offered a interesting job offer and I'm, I'll, I'll do this thing where I'll go, OK, 
if this is like the last thing I did, like in three months I died after this, would I be okay if I, this is the last thing I did? And that's way too much pressure to put on a project, right? But if I go, no, I would be so mad I said yes to this. Well, why? Because I wish I would have said yes to this other thing. I wish I would have done this other thing. Then the question is, well, why are you ignoring that now? Like what is caught, if that's the deepest thing in you, the deepest thing you want to do, why are you not paying attention to that? Well, I, it's too hard to accomplish. I'm too afraid of it. That's the, that's the real conversation. You know, that's the deeper conversation you're yes. trying to get to mm-hmm. um, is in that. And so um, I don't know, like this is not a book that can say you're going to get everything you want by reading this book or applying these practices. I think the practices are there to like, help you fan the flame of being alive. Like what you really want is you want the rapturous experience of being alive. And there are, there's a way to walk in your life that keeps you alive, that, that wakes you up in the morning. That is like the journey you want to take the outcomes. Those you have to stay open-handed with. I have a story about, I heard this interview with JJ Abrams and when he entered, when he made force awakens, this uh, podcaster was like, how does it feel to have made a Star Wars film? Is it like your greatest accomplishment? And he goes, can I tell you, I've never felt different after every accomplishment. I always thought I would. He's like, I thought when I got my first screenwriting gig, I thought I'd feel different and I didn't. I thought when I saw my name up on a big screen, I thought I'd feel different and I haven't. (laughs) And he goes through and he's like, even doing a Star Wars film, it hasn't made me feel different in the way of like accomplishment or now I've arrived or now it fulfilled me. And uh, he goes, but I have enjoyed the journey of each one of those projects. And I now just like go, is this the kind of project that I would, a journey I would enjoy going on? Mm. And I think that's the myth of like, if I finally got to this destination, then I would be fulfilled. Then I would be happy. This, one of the catalysts for all of this is when Anthony Bourdain killed himself. Because Anthony Bourdain, celebrity chef, travel guide, you know, I don't want to be in exactly his career, but to me and a lot of my friends who are makers, Anthony Bourdain looked like what we all wanted, which is we want to be unabashedly ourselves. And in that, and we're good at something. And in that, it brings us a lot of opportunities and fame and success and stuff like that. And I know he had a complicated life. I know there was cost for what he was doing with that release of the Roadrunner documentary. We saw a lot of like, there's some hard things, but like his suicide said, well, I don't even want to be in my life and I have everything you want. And that mirrored something in me where I was like, well, Scott, what do you think it's going to do for you? If, and, and I realized like there's no plan forward going, if I get to all these uh, goals and accomplishments, I'll finally feel better. <laughs> and maybe that's the curse of the four. You're never incomplete. You're never complete. So I, I knew I had to go, well, I have to develop a way of living, a practice of life that isn't about getting to accomplishments, but it's about a, being in a rhythm of living that helps me stay alive that helps me like become like experience the rapturous experience of being alive. Does that make sense? You need this bullshit on that. Like that's mm-hmm. that, that for me is like the, the dream is less about the goal that will happen. Cause we've heard story after story, a football teams wins the super bowl and on the bus ride home, they're like, next year we're going to do it. You know, they're immediately on the next one. We've heard the like person who wins the Oscar and the actress, and then she's sitting in her hotel room. Like, is this it? Is this all I, is this what it, it's not feeling what I'm, I thought it would feel, mm-hmm. you know, I think we've all heard those stories of like getting to the thing you get to won't necessarily fill you in the way that you hoped it's, but if you were aware and awake and, and, and loving the process on that journey, that's where all the gold is. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I I was in a uh, a twelve step meeting the other night, and I was, uh, you know, uh, talking. I had you know a moment to share, and I the topic was something like frustration, dealing with frustration, you know. And this is a phrase that's come up a lot for me lately. So this is a very timely conversation. Yeah. One of the things I've been saying to myself of late is, and to others near to me is. I need a new dream. Mm. I need mm-hmm. a new dream. 
Yeah. Uh, I feel like I've, in, in some ways, and that's not to say that, you know, I don't want to be an author anymore. I don't want to be a speaker anymore. I don't want to be an Episcopal priest anymore. You know, it doesn't mean any of that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the idea of a, of a new dream, like, mm. yeah. for your life. And I think that happens, you know. And, and, yeah. and yet, I don't know entirely what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though I have suspicions, mm -hmm. but they're frightening. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because they represent some fairly significant shifts, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. And you know where they came about? Mm. Was uh, I? I was on a weekend. I was the. I was. Uh, we've spoken about this, but I, I was a group therapist on a weekend for addicts, and it was a uh -huh. therapeutic intensive. So I had four days leading six hours of group therapy a day with five or six addicts. Wow. Okay. And. I have to tell you, I haven't done group therapy. I haven't, I haven't had a therapy practice in over 20 years. I, you know, it's a, you know, I love psychology. I love spirituality. I love all that stuff, but I haven't practiced it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happened on that weekend for me was I, six hours a day, I was physically a, exhausted and spiritually lit up. Hmm. in a way I haven't been in a long time. It, like, oh, it, it yeah. opened uh, something inside of me that it's not like it, it hasn't been a feature of my life, but not, not that way. Not, yeah. not, it didn't, not burning that brightly, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so I'm not saying, okay, now I'll be a group therapist. What I'm interested in is what was it that mm -hmm. illuminated or lit right. up that part of me yeah. that, 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 that or that enlivened me brought life yes. to me in a way yes. that i had not experienced in yeah. in a long time and now the question becomes okay well how do i tap into that yes. with my givens mm -hmm. yes that's you know? good yes. yeah yes i have a story in here my friend katie i'll make it real quick but she like graduated from architecture school was an architect had babies 12 years later she's like i want to go back to architecture she gets back into architecture and she's like oh i thought i'd start at the lowest you know job but because of her 12 year gap and she like became the household manager and stuff like she was using all these managerial skills and so she got promoted to like project manager and she's like oh my gosh these are all my dreams accomplished and then she hated it because mm. it was so much and she had changed and she was like She's like, in some ways I was trying to escape just being a full-time mom because I'd spent so many years doing that. But now I realize that actually being a mom gave me a lot of life and I had hardly any time for my kids. Mm. And so she had to like step back. She had to quit that job. And then now she's like, <laughs> she goes, now I have a bit of like a Mike Brady kind of architecture firm. <laughs> she's like, I used to, she grew up, I watched Brady Bunch and Mike Brady had his office at home. He could be with his kids, he could take his calls. And so she's like, I have this little tiny corner office in my house. I'm still available. And she's like, I like this job a lot more. So it's it's exact kind of what you're saying is like, I had this idea of what I wanted or I found what was giving me life. But then when I got into it, I was like, no, it's, I, it's not all this. There's a different way I need to adapt this and then find your adaptation with the things you already have. Yes. You know, so when I hear you speaking, you're like, look, it's really exhausting, but it's really life giving. Here, I got to go, here's where I'm at with my career. Here's where I'm at with my capabilities and, and possibilities, uh, geography, whatever it is. Like, how could, so, but I, it's stirring life in me. That's what I need to pay attention to. What's bringing me to life right now? And then finding how it all kind of uniquely works out in a way that's unforeseen, in a surprising yeah. way. Yeah, and I, I would say that for me, the experience, what the experience alerted me to was you know for a lot of years i have connected with people but there's always been one to five degrees of separation so mm. you you write a book it sells a lot but you really don't meet you don't interact with those people face to face for sure. like mm -hmm. you know you run in you know they may come up to you in a restaurant right. or an airport or something and say hey, thank you very much blah blah blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah. but you don't actually do the heart and soul work with that person like face yeah. to face with your hand on their shoulder eye to eye um you know you have a podcast we talk to people i right. don't see them right you know it's like i throw i'm throwing stuff out into the clouds and i don't really know i don't have the ex that i don't know that heart to heart physical experience with them mm -hmm. and uh 
And so I do know right now, as I've done a lot of thinking about this lately, is like, how do I change that? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean you throw out everything else you do. It's like, I just have to figure out, all right, well, how does that become part of a steady diet? Because I do think that's where I'm at my best. Mm -hmm. My best yeah. is, is not as a writer, actually. It's mm -hmm. not yeah. as a podcaster. It's not yeah. as any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's me in a room with mm -hmm. people, uh, eye to eye, uh, on the dangerous mission of exploring the mystery of who we are and who God is in that moment. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so this has actually been a good conversation for me today, man. Yes, I love that's it. cool. I love I, it. The best podcast is where we're all getting something out of it for yeah. sure. It's yeah. fun. Thank you for sharing a bit of your journeys with me too. I, I'm, I'm, I wish we had more time to talk because I'm real curious about yeah, like how you're navigating all of these, you know, even Anthony, like you mentioned, like this thing failed, but like, what mm -hmm. were the elements of that that are still in you that you're mm -hmm. like, I can't, I got to give honor to that and finding out new ways to do that and stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. you have seven minutes to your next interview, so we're gonna we're gonna let you go. All right, we yeah. we we're. I just want to remind everybody uh, about Scott's book. Say yes, discovering the surprising life beyond the death of a dream. You can get that on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever fine books are sold. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, how else can people learn about you? Uh, I'm Scott the Painter on all socials, and you can find me there and interact with me there. I'm also this book came out of a tour a show and i'm spending this last year 2022 finishing off touring it like bringing it to cities and stuff so um i'm posting those on my socials when i'm when they're booked and stuff so hopefully i'm coming to a city near you so come to the show this is a much different experience than a book there's a whole crowd interactive part and it's a i call it a liturgy of not giving up on ourselves so mm. i involve the audience in creating the liturgy together and that's and it's about not giving up on our lives and saying yes to it so yeah, it's great. It's fun beautiful, to do. Beautiful. Yeah. I also want to tell people your website is uh, scotterickssonart.com, yes. and that's E-R-I-C-K. C-K, I put both of them. We put both of them in there. Scotterickssonart.com. Scott, man, thank yeah. you so much. When you're in Nashville, would you give me a holler? I would. I would. I mean, we were supposed to do this face-to-face, -face, but Omicron and weather and all the things. So I know. We'll do, we'll do it another time. All yeah, right, brother. Really to good to spend time with you. Uh, yeah. My dear friends out there, Typology family, may you have love, may you have joy, may you have peace, may you have healing, and may you have rest. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>